basics of <laughs> Thank you for coming Friday afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Jim Nisbet. I'm the Vice President of Engineering and CTO at Logly. Um, my associate here is Philip O'Toole, who's the lead architect of our infrastructure team. And we're going to talk to you today about uh, our use of a number of open source technologies, as well as our use of uh, Amazon technologies to build our, our log ingestion infrastructure. Let me just spend a couple of moments and talk to you about what Logly does. Um, we're a log management as a service company where we will, uh, where customers uh, send us log events in real time and we provide the infrastructure to index those and a web application that lets you search and gain insights from that. We're a distributed architecture built from the beginning using AWS. Our initial production services were offered in 2010, our first generation services. And just a couple of months ago, we introduced our second generation of Logly with a, with a brand new event in, ingestion infrastructure. Um, we have thousands of customers. Um, a lot of them are in the cloud customers. And we can just cover a little bit of those details coming up. Just looking at the agenda of the presentation, I thought what I would start off by doing is talking a little bit about logging, the lessons we learned in our first generation infrastructure, how we leverage AWS services, and then also uh, our use of Kafka, Storm, and Elasticsearch. Um, we also thought we would add what worked well for us and a couple of slides on what didn't, which is, will be helpful for those of you uh, embracing these technologies. Let me start off with the basics, because I think almost everyone starts this way, um, where logs are just these primary, usually text files, sometimes binary, but usually text files that your applications are just depending to. Not really super sophisticated in terms of a structure, but every application produces at log files. Your operating system produces a collection of log files. And what happens is, as each, each instance you deploy has those collections of log files, as you install more middleware, you have more log files. As you replicate for scalability and have more instances, you have more different copies of those files. And so log management often starts without being named as such, just doing the simple things, using log rotate, um, kind of things where if a, a file gets to its maximum size, you'll start a new file, compressing the old files, eventually deleting those files. Um, and what you'll find, stop me if those of you have already done this before, is the information is there, but it's awkward to find. And so you'll write special purpose programs to go try and hunting down the, the information. Um, and the other thing that happens over time using these ad hoc mechanisms is you really just ha develop weird kind of retention policies. Some logs are retained essentially too long. Other logs are retained not long enough because you once ran out of space on a partition that those logs were in and stuff. So that's the way a lot of people are introduced to log management. Um, and in this highly technical slide, um, I've shown the amount of log data and the amount of self-inflicted pain. And the way I'm looking at self-inflicted pain is um, the amount of time you're spending juggling the resources that you, that you need and providing accessibility to log management. As your volume grows, you're going to start looking and saying, gee, our logs are a little bit bloated. Sometimes you're running services at debug level. Sometimes you, you have uh, uh, multiple collections of information. But we still need that information occasionally for operational reasons. So you're going to let it grow as long as your business grows. I'll walk over here just so I can talk to both sides. Okay. Um, so um, you know, as your volume continues to grow, oftentimes people will look and say, we need to do something about this. We need to manage the growth. We need to figure, we need to classify the logs. We need to do, do all this. But again, if your business is growing, you're not going to constrain it by how well you're managing your logs. So the volume will continue to grow. And my claim is, eventually, you're going to get to the point where you just want to make this someone else's problem. The volume will continue to grow, and you want to either buy software or make use of a service that manages this complexity for you. Best practices in log management. I just wrote up a couple of things I think are really important. First, in um, looking at modern operating systems, they all support the uh, ability to stream events in real time you know, to an, an aggregation server or aggregation service of some kind. And I think you can take advantage of the existing log infrastructure. I don't think you need a proprietary um, uh, infrastructure to get those logs to, to a central location. 
um, uh, things, uh, um, serv Unix services such as Syslog NG and our Syslog support the ability to monitor files, or you can uh, send UDP messages to those services um, so that the, they're written to the standard files. Hello? Oh, you can use the existing infrastructure uh, to get your, uh, your to, to transmit your logs. Um, and in doing so, um, you have the ability to transmit them to multiple places and you're basically um, you know, all set to go. The second best practice seems, seems pretty clear. So you wanna store these, thing, these messages externally. Um, if the system that uh, is generating those log messages is, uh, is down or exhibiting some sort of problem, you don't wanna have to be able, you don't wanna be forced to log into that system if it's even possible to recover information about what it was doing. Um, the third one is think of log messages as being consumed by two different classes of entities. Um, and this is really important. And those of you that are developers, I, I think will really save a lot of time. The first class of entity is people. You're writing messages for yourself initially, for DevOps later, for, for uh, troubleshooting and tech support. And so it makes sense. You're writing a message to be digested by a human being. But the second class, which is increasingly coming about, is it enters the category of semi-structured data. So the second class of consumer is our machines, our programs that are parsing and analyzing those log messages. So in terms of a best practice, if what you're trying to write out is a highly structured piece of information, use JSON. Just serialize it as a JSON message. It's easy for machines to read. Um, it's, it's reasonably easy for a person to read in a, you know, a compressed format. Um, and that will be um, a very sort of solid way of getting that information through the log infrastructure to, to its final destination. The other mechanism that you can use is use some sort of keyword equal value uh, you know, pair if you're writing out information, perhaps append it to the end of a log message instead of writing an Englishy message or instead of auto scaling uh, the increments or really trying to favor the human being. Think of the two consumers. How do you make a brain dead simple format that will, that, that will uh, achieve those results? So I thought I'd put something from the trenches. Now, admit it. It, I know it's Friday afternoon, but how often have you seen this kind of thing from an operational standpoint? Step one, if you run out of disk space, delete those damn log files. Um, step two is, oh, um, maybe we should look at those log files to figure out what the hell just happened. You know, um, so um, I, you know, my strong case here is don't make this an either or. You know, you don't, don't, don't say I'm either gonna manage my application or I'm gonna manage my logs. Um, um, you know, create a, use a logging infrastructure that is independent of your applications. Because when you need it most, um, it, you know, is, is when the applications are misbehaving somehow or you need to go back and look at trends. Um, I wish I could say that that was just a made up example, by the way. I actually remember the person who wrote it. <clears throat> um, so we all have logs, we know what they are. Um, uh, but I, you know, I just took one example um, that we posted on our website not so long ago. If you have a Java application and you've turned on um, writing out debugging information about garbage collection, you'll have a ton of these messages that says, you know, you know, how long did a full GC take? How long did a minor GC take? And you can look at all these messages and you can send these messages to a log management system. And I think any of the systems that, that you look at will have the basic ability to search those those logs. Um, so you, if you know what you're looking for, you can search and find out, let me look at all the Java GC messages, or let me look at all the full GCs. Um, and I think that's good, um, but increasingly, as we're watching orders of magnitude increases in volume, you realize, I don't wanna look at the individual messages. I can't find the exceptions myself. I wanna grab the data and just look at trends. And so this is just a, a simple example of grabbing the GC time and saying, how long did a, a GC cycle take, a minor and major, what was the size of the heap? This is simple, practical analytics based on your log data as a source of information. You just very quickly want to find out what's going on. And then once you do find out what's going on, you said, when was that going on? And then you can drill into additional messages after that. Logly offers this as a, you know, as a service, and I thought the next thing I could talk to you about was 
what our Generation One service looked like, you know, um, and, and uh, how we went about solving the problem when we first introduced this service. So we knew we wanted to do real-time indexing of logs. Um, uh, we we um, have thousands of customers uh, ranging in volumes of 10 events per second to 100,000 events per second, so widely differing volume. One thing we came to recognize is that the logging volume that our systems see follows um, the peak activities during the workday, during weekends and holiday seasons and stuff. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it because um, when your, if your system writes out a certain number of messages for, for every event process or for every customer acquisition or for every purchase, as, as those systems are busier, they write out more log messages. So we end up uh, being able to do certain predictive analysis in terms of allocating additional indexing resources, just knowing that you'll follow a, a, a daily cycle. Um, um, the thing that may not be as obvious is that logs, unlike your, your customer-facing systems, also have periods of very high activity during internal maintenance periods. If you're running some collection of internal processes, they could be very chatty to the logs, and we'll see peak activity periods that don't just last for minutes, they last for hours. So that was the challenge in terms of building a, a logging service. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we deployed uh, you know, initially on Amazon uh, using not VPC instances, they weren't available then, we used EC2 instances. Uh, I think perhaps our experience was similar to others in that we wanted the persistence of EBS, but there was a high degree of variab variability prior to provision DIOPS. So we ended up using ephemeral storage, instance storage, uh, and we ended up replicating the indexes across nodes. Um, uh, we knew we wanted to use Lucene for the power of that search engine, but Lucene is a Java library. It's not, it's, it's not a clustered uh, uh, search engine. So we ended up using solar, uh, uh, something called Solar Cloud, um, and we used that as the mechanism to support our cluster of indexes. Because we have thousands of customers, because a lot of those customers are low volume customers, um, in addition to these very high volume customers, we ended up uh, heavily modifying that code base to be able to support many more uh, shards than, than your typical Solar Cloud installation. And we used 0MQ as a terrifically fast um, non-persistent message queue. So lessons learned in the first generation um, was our event ingestion, taking events from the customers, was too tightly coupled to the back-end indexing. Um, so if we experienced a temporary resource problem on Solar Cloud where we had to reconfigure the system, we would have to go back and manually schedule the re-indexing of previous customer data. So our event ingestion pipeline um, could support a brief period of time, uh, you know, uh, five minutes worth of um, the backend system not being available, but not longer time than that. And that was a lesson learned. The other lesson learned uh, was that our particular customer base, comparing our low volume customers to our high volume customers, there's four orders of magnitude difference between those customers. So we needed very, um, uh, in our first generation system, it was hard for us to efficiently manage the low volume customers. It was also at times hard for us to effectively manage very high volume customers. So we wanted different strategies for how we managed the indexes, for when we chose to break the indexes into pieces called shards. Um, uh, and um, what we found is that our low volume customers and our high volume customers were sometimes the same customer. They would be very low volume until all of a sudden they turned on different systems or they were backlogged and they shipped us logs and there'd be a very high volume customer. So all of that was flexibility that we learned during our, you know, our, you know, our first generation. So big data infrastructure solutions. I couldn't think of anything else other than uh, Jeopardy here. You know, to, um, we realized that we weren't alone because when we started looking at the second generation system, we realized we have a massive incoming event stream coming from many customers. We're fundamentally multi-tenant. We don't build separate stove, type, stove piped um, systems, they all share their common resources. Uh, we needed a scalable framework for the analysis and analytics we do on logs, 
with near real-time indexing, with time series data. And fundamentally, we realized we were looking at a lot of common big data infrastructure solutions. What I thought I'd do is just cover a, real quickly Kafka, Storm, and Elasticsearch, just uh, in term, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, and then Philip will get into the details of how we use it in our Gen2 system. So Apache Kafka, for those of you who don't know, is a high-performance, persistent message queue. Um, it's notable in that the um, producer doesn't track who is consuming the information. It's up to the consumers to track where they are. As a result, you end up keeping the last 24 hours, let's say 24 hours or a large period of time uh, worth of data longer than any, it would take any consumers to consume. And what it gives us is it's a specially optimized persistent message queue that doesn't degrade when the amount of messages in the system is large. In fact, there is no degradation because all messages go, go to disk. Um, and uh, you know, secondarily, we get the benefit of a system optimized for, for real-time event processing. Um, looking just at the, um, oh, I should mention LinkedIn developed Kafka and open sourced it, and now it is now an Apache project. But looking at some of the um, uh, performance characteristics, and we also measured these, this comes from the paper on Kafka, um, they're, they're really exciting uh, using this kind of technique. What this shows us is that on a single machine, modestly configured system by today's standards, um, a single Kafka producer can produce, can emit messages at 400,000 messages a second and sustain that kind of speed, about 400,000. Uh, what it says then is the consumer that does have to keep track of where they are can consume at 200,000 messages per second. And these kind of numbers allow us to scale, obviously they support horizontal scalability, and scale to the kind of numbers that we, that we have to deal with. So we're very pleased with the performance of Kafka. Second of all, let me talk to you a little bit about the STORM framework. Um, for, again, uh, developed by Twitter, open sourced uh, uh, in 2001, is now an Apache incubator project. What STORM is, is it's a complex event processing framework. Um, it lets you write the, pro the, the processing um, uh, information that you want, write the, the code that you want as how you want to deal with the events and have the framework take uh, um, uh, guarantee a single delivery of, you know, of each of the events and guarantee that you can take nodes in and out of the system. Um, Storm has its own terminology, and again, just so to, for, to be helpful as you look at how we use it, let me just cover a, a simple logical view of, of what a Storm cluster lets you do. Um, you can define a topology which basically says, um, uh, and again, using the Storm terminology, I have a spout that knows how to read information and emit a stream of tuples. In our case, it's log events. And then I have, I can connect that to a bolt um, that does some processing and has the option of emitting one or more streams itself so you can break up the processing. Um, it's okay to uh, group, uh, to tell the, the cluster to group the uh, two bolts together so there isn't a network hop between that processing. But uh, you get uh, the notion of a topology deployed on a storm cluster. Um, looking at more a resource view of Storm, um, Storm consists of a master um, scheduler and monitor which simply has to be, uh, which simply keeps track of where the worker nodes are on, in, in the Storm cluster. Uh, the master is called Nimbus um, and it keeps track in Zookeeper of where uh, the information is. And then there are worker nodes that are added to the, to the cluster. The semantic for the bolts you know, are that you will get each event at least once. In the event that you shut down a node or, uh, or start it, you may get it more than once. Storm supports a transactional topology that you can guarantee an only once um, uh, semantic. We don't use that because our transactions are idempotent. We can replay them, and so we can take advantage of a slightly higher performance mechanism in Storm. Um, but the, the really neat part for us is, as we're processing events, if we get behind, we add worker notes. As we're, as we're dealing with stuff, if it's clear that we're, we've, you know, uh, we're over-provisioned, we can shut those down. So it's a wonderful marriage between the kind of um, uh, infrastructure and framework that, you, that you're provided and what you can do you know, in the cloud with AWS. The third component I want to talk about is Elasticsearch. 
Despite its name, Elasticsearch is not actually an Amazon service. Um, it's a separate open source project um, uh, um, that it now has a commercial company, Elasticsearch.com, uh, that will offer support for it. And what Elasticsearch is, is it's a distributed, clustered, high-performance search engine. Um, it is the framework around the Lucene library that lets us ac access that information. Um, um, it, uh, for those of you who are familiar with different search technologies, it would be similar to the role that solar played in our, in our first generation. What we really liked about Elasticsearch is that it was designed for the kind of real-time events, or certainly makes it very easy for us to manage with uh, real-time events. We can do things like add additional nodes, delete nodes uh, dynamically. Uh, the nodes have storage on them. The storage is where you store the indexes. Um, we can assign attributes to indexes and nodes so that as usage changes, we can, over the long term, migrate uh, indexes and the shards that are underneath them to different nodes. It all the things that, uh, frame, that we would hope for in a framework in that it will manage replicas and, um, uh, and it will um, manage uh, the overall cluster state. Uh, in addition to that, there's a high performance bulk insertion mechanism which we use. Um, we actually heavily mm, uh, uh, pre-process the input stream for maximum efficiency. Um, it, you know, uh, in terms of uh, bulk insertions into the Elasticsearch index. So next, I, we're going to talk about our second generation. I can think of no one better to talk about it than Philip O'Toole, our lead architect, who built the second generation, or his team built it. No? no? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Jim. Um, as Jim said, my name is Philip. I'm the lead developer on the infrastructure team. I have to give my colleagues credit. It wasn't just, wasn't just I who built this. It was a, a bunch of us have been working on it for the last year. Um, I'm very proud of what we built, very excited, and, and I just hope to be generous today to give you some details. Um, I want to talk about, there's kind of three sections to this talk, uh, th th this part of the presentation. First of all, I want to show you the logical view, how we hooked all these components together, give you an idea where our software hooked into it as well. The second thing I'll do is I'll give some specific technical details on the resources and infrastructure we used in AWS to actually build this system in reality, hopefully to help you people out there to understand what we had to do and what resources we used. There's a lot of other resources in AWS we use as well that aren't explicitly shown here. And the third thing I'll talk about briefly is some details Jim alluded to earlier on about what didn't work for us. There are some technologies that I'm sure work for people out there really, really well. They didn't quite meld with our system, especially as we tried to solve the problem once. Fred Brooks has that famous saying about plan to throw one away because you always will. We definitely went through some of that and we learned some, some things about different technologies that we tried to use. So when I joined Logly a year and a half ago, this was the challenge that Charlie, our CEO, gave me. He said, we want a system that can A, always accept log data. Obvious, but why is that important? It's important because, as Jim said, a lot of our customers are busiest when they're, when they're busy or when there's something going on in their system. And we wanted to make sure that we had an ingestion pipeline that would always take the data off them. We never wanted to make the incident worse by back pressure or anything like this. We really wanted to make sure we accepted the log data. Uh, the next one was never drop the log data. Again, obvious to some people, but as a developer, I really appreciate that all it takes is one log message to completely change your mental model of how your system is working, or an operations person can just miss one message. So never dropping a log message was very important. And third, and actually just to that point, our customers had told us that in the event, they would rather have increased latency than losing data. So if we could say to you, well, we can always be caught up to your data stream, but some might messages may not be there, they said no. We would rather you be a few minutes behind and make sure that the data is always there. And I'm sure your customers feel the same way as well. And the third one was true elasticity. We wanted to make sure that the system that we built really would scale, given the, cap the opportunities we have for scaling when we run in the cloud. So it was important that the components we designed did scale both horizontally and vertically. So just to, re to reiterate some of the stuff that Jim had mentioned, this made some of the technologies that we pick work really well for us. Apache Kafka is extremely high performance, pub sub persistent queue. The fact that the consumers track their location in the queue makes it, makes it perform very well. And the fact that you can run as many Kafka brokers as you're prepared to pay for and get increasing performance works really well in AWS and in the cloud. 
We run multiple brokers per region. We run across regions, run across zones. And the availability zones operation has been really good and has helped us out a lot. So that's the great thing about Kafka. It really scales in a horizontal manner. Storm, again, you can throw as much resources as you're prepared to provision and pay money for. It gives you extra, extra processing power as you add more nodes. It's a little bit more difficult to tune than, than Kafka, but the horizontal scalability is there. The nice thing about our Storm framework, and I'll get into it graphically in a moment, is that it's the first part of our system that pulls. So we're able to engineer Storm for an average workload, which is much easier to engineer than trying to engineer for a peak workload, because you know, what is your peak load workload going to ever be? So Storm is the first part of our system that pulls from Kafka, allowing us to be sure as long as we have enough resources over the long run, we'll keep up with the incoming data stream. And it is elastic. You can provision many worker nodes. We provision them across availability zones so that if we lose, we don't lose it. If Amazon loses an availability zone, we can still keep processing data. And it's actually quite well. And we've tested this. Pulling nodes actually works quite well. So Storm also worked well for us. So what I'd like to do is to, to show you how our system is scaled together. I'm actually going to tell the story and show it graphically of what happens when your log of message arrives at Logly to give you an idea of how the components hook together and what happens to your data. So we all know what log data looks like. It's a stream of never-ending events. Most importantly, it's time-stamped. So you can tell which event happened before one or the other. And this, we call it the Logly Firehose in honor of what Twitter calls their firehose. So this data is constantly coming at us whether we want it or not. Our particular system can, over 100,000 events a second is, happens all the time. We support three different types of protocols. Streaming over TCP, RFC 54124 or 3164, or over UDP, and we also support HTTP, so people can post their logs to us if they wish over HTTP. We prefer TCP, it's reliable, it works quite well. People can send UDP, but then I can't promise you we can't drop it, because I can't promise you we got it. So TCP is by far our most common, common way of people sending data to us, and it's what syslog works really well. So your event comes in, and the first thing it hits is these custom collectors that we built. And these are custom high-performance processes we wrote in, in C++. We run them across the multiple availability zones. And all these, these guys have to do is pull bits off the wire and perform some validation on them. Validation on them is to make sure that they're compliant with the RFC. We're very, um, standards are important to us. They help us as engineers talk to one another. And they help people understand what, what we're building and what we're providing. So they pull data off the wire, make sure they look like log messages, and send it on to our next stage which is a cross-connect to our first, the queues in our Kafka cluster. And this is where Kafka kicks in. So collectors do nothing with this. They're all about RAM. The idea is a message goes into the collector, and it's there for a few nanoseconds, and it's out the other side. Straight into our Kafka cluster, where Kafka persists it to disk immediately. And this has worked really well for us. We run multiple Kafka brokers. The numbers aren't important, because they scale up and down as we need more performance and as we use a a AWS. But this Kafka cl broker cluster runs in multi across multiple availability zones. It sits on top of provision DBS volumes. I talk a little bit more about that in a little bit later. And we run multiple partitions. And this is the very first part that your data comes in and hits us. And the nice thing about this is it looks simple, but it took us quite a while to really come up with this in a robust implementation and design. But just this alone allows us to address the first two points that was the design goal that Charlie gave me. Always accept the data, because the collectors really move, and make sure it's safe. And I can promise you that once an event gets from here and onto the disk here, it's safe. Now, EBS is persistent. You have to monitor it. But generally, its quality is very, very high. And this, so this means that the first two parts of our design goal have been met. After this, this is where we move into the pull side of our, our infrastructure. And this is where Storm comes in. And Storm pulls from Kafka. This is a model that other people definitely use, and it's one we follow as well. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more about what's actually going on inside the Storm framework. But this is, the, this is what we call the first stage of our ingestion pipeline, and it's, it's worked out really well. And then from Storm, I'll be delving into this a little bit more, we go into more Kafka queues. But this is the main design principle on which our ingestion pipeline is built. And just as a little sidetrack, the collectors, which I'm very proud of, actually, because we did a nice job. They're C++. They're multi-threaded. We built them on the Boost ASIO framework, which is a joy to code against. I recommend it if anybody's looking to build high-performance network software. And early on in our performance testing, to go back to the point that we always want to accept customers' data. We don't want to let them down. Each collector, we rate it as each collector alone, even though we run multiple ones for redundancy, could easily handle 250,000 events a second 
when running on an M2-2x large instance, which is plenty of memory. Collectors are all about CPU and RAM, and once you give it to them, the Amazon framework and the software you wrote was able to scale. So that really addressed our first point, and we were very happy with that. And of course, Kafka could keep up with this. No problem at all. It could take data from the collectors at this rate. So it worked very, very well. So now let me dive a little bit into what we actually do with the events in the storm framework. So now your data has gone through the collectors. It's safely sitting on disk, but of course it's actually in the buffer cache that Kafka uses, so it's, it's easy to read from Kafka in a high-performant manner, but it's, it's safe. So what, do we, what is the first thing we do with the events? From your Kafka queue, we go into our storm topology. We run many topologies, but this is our main one. And we go into what's known as a Kafka spout. Jim alluded to this concept earlier on. We use the open source Kafka spout that's available with Storm, but we've modified it quite a bit for our own purposes. We run multiple instances of the software object I'm showing up here, again, because Amazon scales horizontally, and, and this software intrinsically scales horizontally. So numbers aren't important because they change all the time, but we certainly run more than one instance of each of these. We do multiple other things in our stream. We do classification. We do summary statistics. A lot of important stuff that goes on here. The summary statistics are mostly for our own monitoring. If you're new to building these distributed systems, as I was over a couple of years ago, you'll find out you will f monitoring is really important. If you don't know that now, you're, you're going to find it out. So monitoring is very important. And our classification is all about identifying the data that's, that's coming into us. Who is it coming from? What kind of type is it? What should we do with it next? And all this is happening in real time. Another very important component that we do inside our storm event processing is rate monitoring. Rate monitoring is very important. It's related to statistics. But rate monitoring is like the valves on an engine. It's telling our pipeline what's going on, what resources we're going to have to permission in the indexers downstream, which I haven't even got to yet. So rate monitoring, who's sending us at what rate, again, is very important. So that's what rate monitoring is all about in our storm framework. And finally, we get to the stage where we run a lot of our secret sauce. A lot of time we spend in this area. Now note I haven't got to the indexers at all yet, but a lot of this is about parsing, more statistic analysis, aggregates we run on the log data, looking for trends. It's all very important what happens in these stages of our storm pipeline. The storm pipeline also allows us to bifurcate the streams. So for example, one of the features that our customers really like is the ability to take their data and send it into S3 in parallel with us sending it into our indexers. And this explains a little bit how Logly thinks about your data, because it's your data at the end of the day, and Logly does not want to be a cul-de-sac for your data. We don't, want to, we don't want people to send data to us, and then they never see it again, apart from through our interface. So we offer our customers the option to stream the data in parallel to their S3 buckets, because we can never, we're never going to think of all the processing that every customer is ever going to want to do on their data. So it's important that we make it available to stream out to their individual S3 buckets if we like, if they like, and we've had this feature in place for quite a while. And what's interesting about this is this is just an example. Other destination sources are, are applicable too. For example, we're very excited about what Amazon announced yesterday about their Kinesis product. There's no reason why Kinesis couldn't simply be another destination of data here. Perhaps you have some other event processing going on. That said, Kinesis could also be a source here. What's important to us is that the data goes through our pipeline and we can run the analytics and indexing on that we want. So this is the storm pipeline, and from the storm pipeline, we go to more Kafka queues. So let's just take a check where we are before we get to the indexers, which is where the real heart and soul of our system is. Storm provides our complex events processing where we run much of our secret sauce. Kafka contains the data in various stages of processing, and what's nice about it, it's sitting on EBS, so we snapshot those volumes every day to EBS as our fallback for DR, for disaster recovery, other purposes that we need. It's important that we're able to Never lose the data. It's important what the customer sent us. So we snapshot the last day of Kafka events to S3. Now this is where we start getting to the real heart and soul of our system and how things are, are linked together. So from Kafka, we have a, a more AWS processes, more processes and software that we run up in AWS. Now, Elasticsearch is obviously very important to us, it's, and I'll get into it a little bit in a few minutes about how we use it. But Elasticsearch, you have to do a lot of things to the data if you really want it to index at a high rate. If you don't, the CPU usage will go through the roof, the RAM will go through the roof. Its own internal state will get quite convoluted and quite hard to manage unless you're very careful about the amount of data that you're pumping into it at the rates and volumes we're talking about here. In my experience, and we've met some people in, in particularly in San Francisco where we're based, we're very interested in the Elasticsearch community, and people consider a four, five, six, seven node Elasticsearch cluster large. 
I'm not going to give numbers because it scales up and down depending, but we have much larger Elasticsearch clusters than that. And once you start pushing Elasticsearch beyond certain nodes, if a certain size, it works very well, but you just have to be more, more careful. And that's why a lot of pre-processing is done on the streams. It's also do this to make it easier to index and easier to, the data easier to find. So up in Amazon, we run special dedicated proprietary, what we call ES riders. We run multiple, Amazon, multiple of these processes in parallel on the AWS infrastructure. And they are constantly pulling from the Kafka queues. Again, everything is a pull system, which makes it very stable. If data is coming in temporarily faster than we can pull it, it simply backs up in Kafka. We don't drop it. Our previous version, which used ZMQ, was memory-based, so the queues can only get so big before you start getting in trouble. The nice thing about Kafka is it gives you the performance of memory, but the persistence of disk. So our ES writers are pulling constantly pulling data from our Kafka queues and sending it into our multi-tier Elasticsearch cluster. And I can dig into a little bit of that in a, in a few minutes. But this is the life cycle of your data as it has flowed through our system, in through the collectors, in through Kafka, in through Storm, and in through ES. And we're very proud of the fact that when the system is working nicely, which it is almost all the time, less than 10 seconds will have passed from when we receive the event to when it's available in the search box in our web app. And so we are quite proud of that. And it, as a developer, I, I want to really make our system, operations have different needs, but I really want to make our system almost like a serial port in the sky. We all know you can plug a serial port on your system, and I really want to make ours like that. So you're talking less than 10 seconds between the whole thing. And actually, most of that latency is due to Kafka because of its periodic flushing to disk. You can make that short period shorter, but then you pay for it in performance. So most of the, it's not network, it's just the cyclical flushes that to disk that a lot of the systems we use are doing. And so we've made that pretty small. Now, one thing I'd like to point out that Kafka also allows us to do, and it's an interesting design principle I think a lot of people can think about when they're building high-performance pipelines is, especially when you're open to the outside world, is I have a friend who works for an ISP in California, in Southern California, and he told me that he, can, when you connect to the outside world, it's chaos. You don't know what data is going to be sent your way. And it's, our customers have a lot of varied data. And we don't have to tell them the scheme or the format it has to be beforehand. They just send us whatever they want. And it's always possible that some bit on the wire that we've seen, even though they can follow, if they follow certain standards, it's, it's their data, and we have to do our best to help them index it, make it available you know, for search. Is there's always possibly something in their data that, that Elasticsearch doesn't like, for whatever reason, Elasticsearch is a complex system. So instead of hammering ES and trying to say, please index its data, the moment the ES says, sorry, I can't index this data right now, we don't drop it because we don't want to lose your data. It's very important. So we write it to another area of Kafka called our deferred storage. And this allows us to take events out of the pipeline that are currently causing Elasticsearch trouble and leave them there for processing later. And then what we can do, what we do do, is every day, twice a day, we have a system that wakes up, checks the deferred storage, sees what's in there, and can re-index it into Elasticsearch again. Perhaps we have to tweak the system slightly, but that's generally not the case. And this goes back to addressing the two or three design, three design principles that I spoke about at the start, is our customers have told us that they would rather have latency than lose data. And this allows us to make sure that their data will always be indexed and available for search. Now, I should add, I'm sorry, I should add that this is a rare scenario, but it is important about making our systems correct, and we call it our deferred storage. There's no queue, per se, coming off, and it's just where data can reside until the other programs can get in and re-index that data. So there's actually a lot going on in our system that isn't shown here because it's proprietary, it's, it's, it's pretty important to us, and it's supplementary to the pipeline, but it is important that you get an idea of what this is. For example, index management is a huge thing that goes on in Elasticsearch. In, Elasticsearch is not intrinsically a multi-tenant system. How you create indexes in it and manage those indexes is how you make it a multi-tenant system. That's a big part of what Logly does. Uh, we do a lot of pre-processing on the data before it goes in to make sure that it's efficiently indexed by ES. Search query, if any of you guys have ever worked with a search engine on the search side, there's a ton of stuff you have to do so that the queries you make to your search engine work. And remember, the point of indexing is to search. So indexes, we, a lot of our index management is, that happens in real time as the pipeline is going through, is indexes are separated by customer, they represent slices of time. If you're a customer and you're sending more data to us, you'll have more indexes covering a shorter time. If you're sending us a small amount of data, you'll have one larger indexes covering a longer amount of time. Our elastic search cluster is also multi-tiered. We throw more re resources at the part that's doing much of the heavy lifting. If you think about it, logs are spread across space and time in terms of their size and space, 
and their time and when they were generated. Just because you generate a log message today doesn't mean that you're going to send it to us today. Perhaps you'll send it to us in a week. But most log messages are in real time. So we, can in, we throw most of our indexing resources at, at messages that are near real time. It also, a lot of the software we wrote allows us to make efficient use of the AWS resources. And that's what, a lot of stuff isn't shown here, but that's because it's outside the main pipeline, which is what we're talking about today. Another big advantage we found with Kafka and, uh, and our general pipeline, and I think this is something else that people may like to learn about, is how we do staging. Now, all companies, they know what they're doing, have a staging idea. Before you roll software out into production, you put it into staging. Cross your fingers if you don't. And it's a dress rehearsal for your operations team to see if there are any gotchas, any schema changes, anything that just might have caught them. But you want your staging system to be a true reflection of your production system. You want the same data as you go through it. It's not much point sending test data. I've been burned more than once by sending test data through our system. Everything looks lovely, and then you send real data, and it acts completely differently. Yet at the same time, you don't want to build a staging system as large as your production system, because you don't want to have to hire another entire operations team. So we managed to use a feature of Kafka that made running a staging system very, very nice. And to go back to it, this is the, ingest the first stage of the ingestion system that I spoke about. We've got the collectors, Kafka brokers, Storm. Because of the way Kafka works, it's, the data is written randomly across these entire partitions. So say, for example, you have 10 partitions in Kafka, and you're just streaming data into Kafka. In its default mode, any one of those partitions has precisely a one-tenth sample of your data. So this is really nice if you think about it. You want a small but representative sample of your incoming traffic. It could be a click stream, it could be log data, it could be perhaps photos that somebody are posting, but you get a really nice sample. So we've used that to mirror, we don't want it to stream, to mirror a fraction of our production stream and send it into a scaled down version of our staging system. And this is really, really nice and it's worked out really well for us. So we get to reuse a lot of our infrastructure but still get a representative sample of data going into what is our most complex part of our pipeline, which is Storm and Elasticsearch onwards. So just to summarize that, because the Kafka broker doesn't care, the Kafka cluster doesn't care how many consumers there are, you can add as many consumers as you want and Kafka doesn't care that performance doesn't drop. And this allows us to run uh, this staging architecture. It's a highly effective pre-production system and anybody who's using Kafka or similar technology, the AWS Kinesis system would allow you to do the same. I was at the presentation yesterday. It's something to think about. It's really, really nice. So let me get into the meat of some of the technical details that might be helpful to you guys out there to say how we actually deploy the system in AWS. What instance types did we use? What IOPS did we use? To give you an idea of what you, you've got in mind if you want to start building systems like this. Our now, now, the numbers don't matter. I mean, they do matter to us, but the number of instances changes because of the way our system works and the way we use AWS. The point is, what types do we use? For our collectors, we use C1X large instances. Collectors are all about disk and network I.O. They don't care about uh, disk. So CPU is a big deal, network is a big deal, and uh, RAM was a big deal. So we found that the C1X large instances were a good price point between and performance for our, what are basically high performance network ingestion software appliances. Now Kafka is very different. Kafka is all about giving it plenty of RAM so that the Linux operating system can use it to buffer the disk cache. So we run our Kafka clusters, brokers on M2 2x large machines. I think they have 34 gigabytes of RAM. Three gigs is given to the JVM and the rest is just left to Linux to buffer the disk cache. So memory optimized instances, CPUs, are, these are by no means uh, low end machines, but they have a different bias towards RAM and CPU versus the collectors. And then, very important, as you can imagine, because Kafka persists to disk, I.O. was very important. And we put, oh, excuse me, we put a, forward there. We put a 4K provisioned IOPS EBS volumes underneath Kafka. Why do we do this? EBS is persistent. You have to monitor it, but it is persistent. But the provisioned IOPS volumes gives you consistent performance, which is really important when it comes to test. So I can say today that the Kafka cluster we have can, can write 250,000 messages to disk per second. Tomorrow, it'll be able to write 250,000 messages to disk per second. And at Sunday at 4 a.m., when somebody bursts to us, it can write 400,000 messages events per second to disk. Provisioned IOPS gives you that because in Amazon, it's a multi-tenant system. You've got noisy neighbors. If you use uh, unprov unprov unprovisioned IOPS EBS volumes, your, your um, 
performance can be great one day and poor the next day, and I guarantee you, you'll be doing your performance testing the day that it's really, really good and walk away feeling great. Um, so the 4K provision diops ensures consistent I.O., no noisy neighbors, and it is persistent, of course, so as long as you monitor it, you can be sure that your data is safe. Why 4K? 4K is fast as you can buy at Amazon right now. We did, this is a very important part of our system. It's where our customers' data lives. We needed high I.O. performance. Storm, actually this is pretty standard. If anybody's familiar with the Storm starter project, this is the specs that they say you should run a Storm cluster in. The difference is how many instances of each you run. Again, we run the C1X large, because Storm is all about compute, RAM, and network. It's not writing anything to disk apart from the log files, but it doesn't do that because the log files go to our, another one of our systems. Right? Uh, so we run our Storm worker nodes, our Storm supervisor nodes on C1X large. Our operations team appreciate this because it's the same instance type as which we run the collectors. The configuration and management components, which is Storm, <coughs> excuse me, Storm Nimbus and our Zookeeper cluster, we don't need huge machines for these. We run them on M1X large, again, 64-bit machines, general purpose configuration and management. Not a huge amount going on here, but they work quite well for us. Spread across multiple availability zones, which is very important. This is where we spend our money, as Charlie, our CEO, knows quite well. This is our multi-tiered Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, we have done a lot of work in our pre-indexing pipeline to ensure that when ES has work to do, it has the least amount of work to do possible. With the result that our indexing performance is, and all the testing and performance and measurement we've done is only limited by I.O., it's not CPU bound. If you don't do a lot of the pre-processing that we do before, you'll find that the CPUs get busy quite quickly. But we still need some fairly beefy machines here. We use the cluster compute 8x large machines um, for 4K provisioned IOPS EBS volumes. And we get great performance from these machines. We put 4K IOPS volumes underneath it. Um, really good performance. And then in our second tier, in tier two, we have uh, 4K provisioned IOPS as well. Slightly smaller, slightly smaller instances because this is where not as much of the heavy lifting, lifting goes on. But this works really, really well for us and we've got great, um, great performance here for, for our indexing. The next slide here. So I'd like to finish with a couple of few false stars that we worked through uh, in, our, in our pipeline. To give you a couple of ideas of color technologies that um, work well for many people but didn't work as well for us as we hoped and we used uh, different, different designs. So the first thing we tried to do is we tried to, we, we tried to put an ELB in front of our collectors and we knew that we'd have to run multiple collectors even though one of them would be enough to take much of our load for a long time. So we, had to, we knew we'd have to run at least three, and we tried to put, a, put an ELB in front of our collectors, but it didn't work very well, even though it works very well for our web apps. Why doesn't it work? Elastic load balancers don't allow forwarding on port 514, which is where we send a lot of our, which is the standard syslog port, according to the RFC. So they don't, wouldn't use that. Also, elastic load balancers don't, use, don't support forwarding over UDP another blocker since we wanted to put it, since some customers do prefer to send messages over UDP. And also, we actually found that the elastic load balancer simply didn't reach the performance characteristics that we needed. Uh, we tried to send plenty of data through them and sometimes they would just not really keep up with the amount of traffic that we wanted to send through. So quickly we found out that an ELB isn't really built to be balancing high performance streaming software-based network appliances. It's great for our uh, web app front ends, but it's, it's not really suitable for when you want to balance traffic into these network appliances, or software network appliances that we put together. What we did like, and Jim actually worked in this, and he's a big fan of this, is we used Amazon 53 DNS. Um, what's nice about this is when you resolve to one of our collectors, you actually get the IP address of the collector itself. So your data gets to go right into the high-performance software that we spend so much time working on. And as Jim likes to say, it's not a bump in the wire. In other words, your traffic gets to a socket that's on the collectors and it works really well. We take advantage of the AWS health check so that if a collector goes wonky or an, AW, an AWS AZ drops out, um, it's transparent to our customers. And this has actually saved us on at least one occasion since we went live three months ago. Amazon had an AZ outage, but none of our customers noticed because the Route 53 DNS made it transparent to our customers. And it helps because it works across multiple regions and AZs, so we can deploy collectors as geographically widespread as we like. 
So there's another thing I wanted to talk about just to give you, a head, uh, give you an idea of another idea we had early on in our design for use that we didn't have going with, and it was Cassandra. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Cassandra here, and it's a highly scalable key value store, really good write performance. Um, it works very well for a lot of the, the target applications that it's used for. Uh, we've met with the, we met with the data tax guys, it works really well. And what we tried to do with Cassandra was, we knew we'd have to have a queue, and we knew we'd have to have an authoritative data store where we would store your data, your events. And we at the time thought, wouldn't it be great if we could use the same technology to do both? It may be obvious to some of you, but key value stores for us are not, we did not find them to be a good match to try and build a queue. So we struggled with this for a little while, and it just turned out not to be the right thing to do. It was better to use a proper queuing system. Um, while we were trying to do this, we, we, we came up with lots of wide row schemas, trying to work out how we could both track the order in which events were received, but when they came out of order, make sure that we still had the order when we sent them into the indexers. Because if you think about it, there's one other thing about log messages that's very important. You, don't want, you always want to accept them. You always want to drop them, or you always want to not drop them. You don't want to drop them. You always want to keep them around, but you also want to present them to you, the end user, in the order for which they were received. If you as a developer have two messages in two different loops, and one loop happens before the other, but we present the log messages in the reverse order, and you believe us, you might think, wow, my software is not working the way I want. Or the machine went down after the disk filled up, as opposed to the disk filling up when the machine went down. So it was very difficult for us to get Cassandra to resolve this issue of how do we make sure that we remember the order of events. And to cut a long story short, it, it, um, key value stores are not good queues. They're great as authoritative sources, but they're not good queues. And as our design went on, Elasticsearch intrinsics, Elasticsearch's intrinsic support for key value store was actually good enough that we now use Elasticsearch as both the indexes and the authoritative data stores. So actually our need for Cassandra and other key value stores has actually is kind of gone away and we don't really need them as much as we used to, with the result that Cassandra is not in our pipeline today. The other thing is while Cassandra is very reliable, it's got replicas, quorum reads, quorum writes, I could write 100,000 events to it very easily after a couple of days of playing with it, it's still a complex system. It's going to have outages, it's going to have failures. And in the event that we had a system whereby collectors were streaming into Kafka, or streaming into Cassandra, what would they do if Cassandra was down, which is going to happen? And we realized, well, they're going to have to buffer to disk. But if collectors are going to buffer to disk, maybe we should just have them write into Kafka and let Kafka buffer to disk. And Kafka is so much simpler in many ways. If it's simpler, it's more liable to stay up, and that's what we have found. So this is the reason why we didn't put a, we left our most complex components, Elasticsearch and the like, much deeper in the pipeline after we were sure that our events were safely persisted to disk. So to, to finish up, I'll just give you a summary of what we found as big wins. Um, Multi-region, multi-AZ has really worked for us. Amazon hammered this point, or AWS hammered this point home a lot, but it really does work. Deploy your services in multiple regions, multiple zones. Run your processes on smaller instances if it means that you then end up with nine as opposed to three, because you want smaller, in my experience, many smaller pieces are better than large monolithic pieces. Large monolithic pieces are for pre-2000. Smaller auto-scaling pieces are what works well with the cloud, because you can deploy it in multiple availability zones. Provisioned IOPS, it's done what it said on the tin, it gives us consistent performance, allows us to scale, allows us to test. Jim has been a big fan of AWS Route 53, worked very well for us, never let us down. And being able to, you know, the, being able to apply that elasticity to uh, increase storm, and decreased storm resources has helped a lot too, so that's been really nice. So, um, and leveraging open source infrastructure, of course, using the technology I talked about has been really good and allowed us to concentrate on building the search and analytics that, that we're really interested in building. Um, so let me finish by saying, the, at the end of the day, the reason we build these pipes, I mean, it's fun as an engineer to move bits from place to place, but the reason I get excited is because all the computers that we're working with are constantly talking, right? They're just constantly saying stuff. They never shut up. They're constantly saying stuff to us. And we as human beings can never listen to it all. And it goes back to Jim's point that I think if you were to take one thing away from this talk, it would be forget about people listening to your computers. Think about computers listening to your computers because that changes the diagnostic information that your computers will spit out. And so you're able to ask the one set of computers, what are these other set of computers doing? And there's a lot of magic that has to happen there. But of course, 
There's no magic, right? It has to be built. But the point of all this is to build applications and build systems that will allow you to um, produce applications. Yes, this is ours, but allows you to produce applications that give and bring joy to your customers and, and they can really enjoy using it. So that's it. And Jim and I will be around for questions if anybody has any. I'm almost out of time. We have four minutes, I think, for questions if anybody has any questions, but otherwise we'll be around. So thank you very much.